The Film Verdict gives you Noir 360, hosted by Rashid Bahati, a global podcast that explores the impact and influence of Black cinema around the world. Welcome to New R360. I'm your host, Rashid Bahati, and this is, of course, a platform of The Film Verdict. And today, I'm very happy to have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Richard Gant. Welcome, Richard. How you doing, man? Well, brother, I'm fine. How are you? Uh, I'm doing great, man. This is something I've been looking forward to, is to talking to you. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you for joining us on Noir 360. Noir 360, I love it. I love it. <laughs> yeah, talking about black film, black culture, black art, you know, anything in the diaspora that we're dealing with, Africa and its diaspora. Um, just to give a little background so people can uh, get to know you a little bit better, uh, Richard is an American actor. His credits uh, include films such as the classic Rocky Five and uh, also... Uh, uh, just a number of other television shows from uh, Miami Vice to Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, uh, Deadwood, which was one of my favorite. I love Deadwood, The Big uh, Lebinsky, uh, Babylon 5, Special Unit 2, L.A. Law, NYPD Blue, Living Single, Posse, which is another one of my favorite uh, films. Uh, Richard, it's just so much here uh, that you've actually done in film and television. And something I realized that you were uh, awarded the keys to the city of Oakland uh, by Mayor Jerry Brown at the time. And... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that was amazing to me. But I know you've always bragged about your uh, beginnings in the theater and that you're still involved in the theater. So let's uh, hop into just getting to know Richard Gann a bit. Um, tell us just a little bit about your background, how you evolved into theater and uh, just who you are from that perspective. Well, I'm from Oakland. And I, I, for me, that's that's huge, and that's 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 ultimate in a lot of ways. Oakland, California. I came along at a time. Uh, I'm out of the service and back in college, at the very college, at the very moment that the Black Panther Party was starting, that was Merritt College. So years later, to get uh, uh, keys to the city, they were giving out. It's not like it was a ceremony for me. It was a ceremony for. Uh, illustratives of Oakland. So um, um, to get the keys at the same time at the Pointer Sisters and and other huge athletes from Oakland and all of those kinds of things, but getting the keys is really what it was all about. Oh, I uh, see. To, to me, it was exciting beyond belief, and um, and you know, uh, uh, as far as awards con are concerned, there's few that I treasure more than Oakland. Than yeah. Oakland. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Oakland has a lustrous history, really. I mean, it's a very yeah. unique uh, environment uh, for uh, black people specifically. Specifically. Um, Athletic-wise, um, uh, when I was coming along, uh, huge people were coming out of Oakland. I, By the way, I just met um, um, a pretty Ricky. Uh, Ricky... Uh, uh, baseball player, Ricky Henderson. Henderson? No. Third uh, thing. He stole all of those bases, that Ricky. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, yeah. Is he playing in Oakland? He he played, he started in Oakland, yeah. Oh, okay. He's from Oakland. Okay. Uh, Henderson, yeah. Uh, he was huge, and, and, uh, and I never got to see him play in person. You know, and so years, years later, I meet him at a club. <laughs> uh, started off in theater there at Merritt College um, um, and uh, went from there. Ended up at the University of California, Berkeley, doing my first big play. Uh, ended up after some years, after about five years, going to New York City where 
uh, I ran into a whole bunch of people that were just like me. They were misfits where they were from. They had to get out of there and go somewhere else and just become something. And out of uh, New York, did a lot of stuff with um, a fellow named Duma Nglovu uh, from South Africa. He, uh, he and I did a bunch of things having to do with bringing black Americans on stage with uh, South Africans. And, well, but, yeah. but before we hop that far ahead, uh, that's cool. That synopsis uh, mm-hmm. of uh, kind of chronologically how you got, you know, to New York and what happened there. But what what led you to theater uh, in Oakland um, at in that time place. period? What 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 kind of got you on stage, so to speak? <laughs> My girlfriend. Your girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> yeah, explain that. Well, I was I was in a dance company doing Latin dance, a cha cha cha, merengue, pachanga, body da, you know. And um, uh, just out of the service, as I said, and so the first black literature class uh, was being was happening at there at that school, uh, and it was at the exact same time that literature was opening up in the state of California at San Francisco State and a couple of other schools had black literature classes. I had read one black book in my life at that point. I was 22 years old. Oh, wow. And uh, and so I fell in love with Langston Hughes and the notion of Harlem. Just 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 mm. that whole literate, literate, literate notion. Loved it. Um that lady, Sarah Fabio, decided she stood up in one of our Black Power rallies. Remember, this was Mary College where Huey Newton and Bobby Seals were going to school there at that moment. Wow. Uh, all kinds of folks used to come through. All kinds of folks. Maulana Ron Karinga, for instance, who doesn't like to be called Maulana Ron Karinga anymore, by the way. He wants to be called uh, Maulana, I guess. Anyway, um, she stood up and announced that there's going to be a black drama uh, group. Uh, and my girlfriend said, I'm joining. So I followed after her. The first play I was in was the first play I ever saw. Because, you know, in high school, I'm not going to be going to CNZ's these plays, Oklahoma and all that. I'm trying to play ball. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so right. I, I never saw a play yeah, other than church play, you know. Uh, so uh, th- and I got hooked. Within huh. three weeks of my first stepping foot on stage, I was directing my first scenes. Wow. I, t- I took to it. I must have did four plays that, that uh, year, that fall and spring semester, and then was out to the state university and was directing out there. Wow. So th- it was just that natural, yep. Uh, yep. something hit you, this is what I'm supposed to be doing, and That's bang, it. there you were. I didn't care, by the way. If I was on stage directing, uh, doing tech, I just wanted to be involved in theater. However, it came out. I I didn't care. Wow. Yeah. That was yeah. Me. Wow. That's that's awesome, Richard. Now that New York experience that you talked about, how was it going to uh, migrating from? Uh, did you actually move to New York, or you just happened to be there and got involved, or how did that transpire for you? First off. It started uh, the summer before I left. I left in 74. Uh, the summer before, we were doing a play in San Francisco at some junior high school's auditorium for the summer. And there was always more people on stage than there was an the audience. The right. big play, the big play that year, the big black play that particular year was at the Fillmore Auditorium. And so nobody was coming to ours. But out of the seven people that was on stage, um, when I got to New York the next year, five of those people were in New York. Hmm. <laughs> One of them, uh, what the hell is his brother's name? One of them, uh, my buddy there in New York took me by his house and he was saying, I got these songs, Gat. I got these songs. And uh, all right, man, we'll play them for me. You know, let me hear them. He was a guy that was on stage with us in New York. This is the brother, can't think of his name right quick. The lead for the village people. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. <laughs> you can't believe it. So it was, it was like that, man. Yeah. Uh, it was fabulous. Yeah. Uh, you could do theater all day, all night. 
and be around nothing but theater people who were from various parts of the United States uh, and who had to leave and to get to New York, this mecca, this 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 melting pot. You know, I, it was it was past fabulous, past fabulous. That's amazing. I think one of the things with New Art 360 that we've kind of evolved into is the stories that people tell about their journey has just really been amazing. And so I'm incorporating a new philosophy around the podcast at this point. I think it's more of uh, uh, the importance of looking at how people get from point A to point B type of thing. It's uh, inspirational and it's inspiring at the same time, you know, all rolled into one. And these are things that you do to make it in life, you know, so yeah. it's a life lesson almost. So while you were in New York and that time period was obviously a very progressive time for theater. It, it, well, it was a, it was a, it will be looked back at <clears throat> as a renaissance. It will. Wow. It was a renaissance. There were, there were 20 black theaters in New York City alone. 20. 20. Wow. I doubt if there's five now. Wow. You know, wow. Because the film has, you know, really moved off. Yeah, yeah. Things have changed a bit. Oh, yeah, but but it was it was it was just past fabulous. So I was there, of course, uh, at the same time with Denzel and Sam, you know, and all those folks, and we all came along together and I directed some of them and acted with to others and you know, it was just fantastic but for me it was the whole south african experience that was huge now explain yeah let's delve into that for a minute the uh, the south african connect at that point um tell us about your friend and then uh how did south africa come to play on that duma brought, duma was an exile uh from south africa he told me how that happened uh he said he drove over to uh Mandela's house, Winnie Mandela's house, and one of her uh, daughters walked. There's a bunch of police cars out of there, in front of there, and one of the daughters, Zinzi, came over to the car, re leaned down into the car, and told him, "Run!" And he said he uh, drove straight to the border, straight, straight to the border, straight. Uh, ended up having to stay there for eight or ten months, and ended up in uh, New York City. Wow. Um, now, a bunch of exiles were there. Well, it's a mecca. mecca. It's a melting pot. And uh, so he kind of found his way. But he was one of those entrepreneurial, artist entrepreneurial types that walks into a place and talks himself into going to Hunter College, you know, and them letting him in and all of that kind of thing. And so he'd be sitting in the president's office at all times and whatnot. <laughs> Uh, so he and I did some, a bunch of stuff at Lincoln Center. He brought a play called A Cinemale to New York. A Cinemale was uh, something called Township Theater, where uh, you just grab a bunch of brothers off the street and uh, do improvs and train them for a year and come up with a play. Interesting. That play was that play was so strong in terms it was about some guys who were in prison. And uh, that play, and looking at those actors that had been trained in that fashion, you you saw that play, you looked at those actors, and you wondered where in you was all of that. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they made you look at your own crap and say, uh, 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 are, you up to, are you up to par? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Where are you? Uh, later on, he was instrumental in bringing Serafina uh, to uh, New York. So the, that's the dude. Incredible. Incredible, yeah. incredible story. Uh, during that time period, were you, also, as you mentioned, Denzel and um, other folk that you were around that are really high up in the hierarchy at this point uh, in film and television, uh, did you uh, also encounter Woody King and people like that in New York? Woody, <laughs> Woody. oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, one of the better plays that I ever directed uh, starring Morgan Freeman, uh, was through Woody. Uh, Woody. Woody did a film called uh, The Prophet, and it's about Malcolm X, right? Okay. And uh, Morgan was Malcolm and uh, uh, Yolanda King, 
uh, Yogi, uh, uh, King's daughter, uh, was his wife in the film. And the notable thing about that film was that when we did the, 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 the killing scene, the people that were in the rainbow, I think the name of the Audubon. Audubon. Audubon, Audubon Ballroom. Audubon yeah. Ballroom. Yeah. We, we shot the scene in the Audubon Ballroom. Ah. And, the, and the people that were in there, the, the audience, were people who were at the original. Oh, my God. Is that, is that film still around? You can find it. Huh. Yeah. The yeah. Prophet oh, by, Wood, it, by Woody King. By Woody King. Oh, okay. I have to yeah, check yeah. that out. Yeah, so no, Woody is a, Woody's a dear friend uh, and an icon in our world. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and I've done a number of plays. With him. Well, I, I only bring that up because of my experience in New York with the theater uh, just through a uh, family member, my uncle, Willis Burks, who was uh, doing a lot of stuff with uh, uh, August Wilson. Um, and uh, I would always go through New York and stay with him in Brooklyn Heights and that kind of thing. And I remember he invited me to a thing. They were honoring Woody King um, at one of the theaters, you know. On 42nd uh -huh. Street or something. Anyway, uh, it was just amazing the the aggregation and the congregation of all of the black actors that were uh -huh. there. People yeah, came from Hollywood. All, yeah, it was amazing. Because oh, all of us came through Woody. Woody yeah, the Negro yeah. Ensemble Company and Woody. Right. Those were, those were the two things. What year was that that you were there? Uh, you know? Yeah, this would have this would have probably been the early 2000s. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, somewhere okay. around maybe two. Uh, you know what? If I'm not mistaken, <laughs> to be honest with you, it was probably right around 9-11 uh, or the year before, or year after, somewhere in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that was a pretty big celebration, wasn't it? It was huge. It yeah, was huge. And I was not there. You were not I, there. I, I, right. I, don't, I don't know if we knew each other at that particular time, but I don't think, uh, so. I don't think we did. But I, I knew who you were. I mean, knew your face, yeah. but uh, definitely some of everybody was there. It was yeah. incredible. It uh, was incredible. Yeah. And all of this access for me, not being a theater person, was through my uncle, Willis uh, Burks. Yeah. Yeah. Who eventually moved here. I, I think you know Willis probably, but he moved here from New York and started doing stuff in Hollywood, more TV and more film stuff. He did a, a feature film with... Uh, uh, Douglas, Michael Douglas, uh, where he was the second lead in the film called King of California. And um, yeah, he's, he's done several things, but uh, a lot of TV stuff. Uh, I have to know him. Yeah, you know him. You know him. Yeah, anyway, yeah. anyway, uh, now. Uh, Woody, Woody, Woody was an icon, uh, is an icon. Yes. Uh, and I, he's kind of retired now. Uh, and his lady runs uh, their theater. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Liz. Now, now, Richard, uh, how long did you stay in New York, and what was going? 16 on? Years. Sixteen, 16 years, years in New York. That's why when we were there last year, everybody knows you. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, sixteen years in Harlem. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm still in love with Harlem. Yeah, yeah. Harlem has changed um, during that time. Back in school, back at university, um, while. I had my icon mentor uh, person in Langston Hughes. I also fell in love with Wally Shoyenka, uh, Nigerian playwright, author, uh, poet. And so I did a number of his shows. Uh, again, this whole notion of Black Americans and uh, Nigerians, uh, you know, hands across the, the water kind of a thing. Okay. I also worked on... Um, uh, uh, a campaign uh, then. Um, and that campaign kind of kept me in the political world. And so in New York City, I was able to run a campaign in Nigeria. Interesting. Yeah, I ended up going to Nigeria and running this uh, campaign. For uh, a, a Nigerian politician? The governor of one of the states, yes. Interesting. And the party for that state. It was wild. I should have paid them. I mean, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. I used to. I, the, the reason I'm sure that I got the job was because 
here clearly is a romantic. He's not there for the money. He's a, he's a romantic. You know, he can do the job. Yeah, bring him on. He's not going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you get a chance to go to I'm Nigeria. At, How long yeah. did you stay over there doing this was, uh, campaign? That was a year. Okay. Wow. That was a year. Had you I'd been be to the, the continent time, before? Had you been to the continent prior I to that? I had been to Nigeria once before. Okay. Okay. So I and I had I had kind of gotten an ability to get through to handle myself. You got to be able to handle yourself in these places, not make mis- stupid mistakes, you know, and handle yourself. And I found that I could. And uh, so when I was had the opportunity to see if I could do that job and ask for it, uh, I was told to come on. I went down to back down to D.C. where I had met a lady named Flo McAfee, who at that time was part of this young group of blacks who were running political campaigns. This is a brand new notion for these people. Uh, they later on became chiefs of staff, uh, a part of the Clinton uh, 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 campaign and, and administration, all of those people. I, ju- I had just met her. I went back down to D.C., uh, told her what I wanted to do, and uh, they wrote me a campaign plan. I went over to Nigeria with the campaign plan, and they, they hired me. <laughs> they hired me. They hired me. <laughs> That's I, I, incredible. And it, was, it was fantastic. I would be setting up the camp and during the campaign stops. I'd be setting things up and hurrying up and getting stuff set up. So Because each one of the stops is a festival. The governor's coming through, so there's going to be a festival in and around that. And I wanted to sit over next to the drummers. So we're going to get this stuff done so I can sit next to the drummers. I should have paid them. I should have right. paid them. I could imagine what that was like. Wow, that's incredible. And on the campaign trail, there might be 20-some vehicles in the, in, the, in the convoy. And we're flying down this road, newly cut road. It's not that doggone wide. Maybe two cars can fit in there grass up to here, you know, uh, the people standing on the side of the road saying one nation, one God, one destiny, NPN party. It's hot as all get out. Dust is in the air condition in the car. I got the radio turned on and on the radio is, is, is Michael Jackson singing Billy Jean. <laughs> you can't make that up. Huh? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so how did that did that open a door uh cuz I know even right now uh to bring things forward a bit you have a passion for the continent and doing things on the continent um did that open the door for you to see another side of the continent or whatever that you just didn't know about and you've been intrigued ever since or what did that do for you that experience of uh, running a campaign in well, Nigeria. It was like, it was like uh, I was doing what I was putting on the face of earth to do. Mm. And it's not so much the campaign. Yes, it, that's, it, you know, that's a skill. That's a, that's a craft. Uh, but it's not so much that it's, it's, it's being there. It's, it's connecting. It's some kind of way connecting my world with theirs, uh, connecting the world. And I think that's, mm. that's what I learned in that literature class. And so it's full circle. Right, right. For that. Um, I have escaped uh, 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 problems, huge problems, just because I'm a romantic, <laughs> right, who's in love with culture, love with people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, get, get passed through. You just, you just, you go on. Right. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. I hear you like that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Probably so. Uh, I don't think about it that way, but I think you bring clarity to what it is, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, you know, now, uh, after this campaign, just we're just kind of staying a little chronological for a minute, um, because I find this so fascinating. Um, You you get back to New York and you decide to come to Hollywood. Uh, How did you make it to Hollywood? I, first of all, I would never have left Nigeria. Okay, would something drove you away? I would have, I would have ended back up at, back in the arts some kind of way, but Nigeria was the promised land. 
in Lagos, I mean, uh, anything is possible. Right. There is nothing that is not possible if you if you can see a way towards it. Right. There's nothing. Right. But what happened was I simply happened to be back in uh, the Bay Area um, uh, in November. The election was over. The whole my whole slate, all 72 people in our state won. Wow. <laughs> um, and so I'm back. I'm, I'm at home for a moment before going back to Nigeria. And my mother comes into the living room where I'm sleeping on the couch in her house there at that moment. Um, she said, uh, Eddie, my middle name, uh, Nelda is on the phone and she said there's been a coup in Nigeria. You know, I was going to bring that up, that <laughs> there was some political turmoil that yes. has been going on in Nigeria for years. Yes. And were you over there when some of this stuff was happening? I was fortunate enough not to be there. All everybody that I knew went to prison. Wow. Everybody. The people Bye. that got elected. Wow, that is so interesting, Richard. Yes, yes. yes. And I just happened not to be there. There was another lady, uh, McBride is her last name, uh, whose daughter uh, was a famous model and was the picture of a particular so-called Omo soap, I believe. And her face was everywhere. Everywhere you looked, every billboard was that beautiful uh, face. Her mother... Uh, an activist out of Harlem, out of New York anyway, um, found herself in Nigeria and was making things happen and was arrested, was released within a couple of days and stayed, stayed in Nigeria. Coup happened, she was re-arrested and was in prison for eight, nine, 10, 11 months before she was finally gotten out. Wow. You know, so that's, that's, that's a reality. That's a reality. And it's not that she was doing wrong as much as she was on the wrong side. And there you are. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, <clears throat> that whole <laughs> political unstableness uh, is a pretty rough one. Um, as you know, I've been dealing with that myself in, um, in Burkina Faso. Just so happens things are not as intense uh, yeah. in the capital city of Ouagadougou as you if you go into other areas of the country. And yeah. um, so I've been fortunate, but you're right. You have to keep your eyes open for things like that. So once you realize this coup had taken place and uh, a lot of the people that you had worked with and people you knew had been arrested and uh, whatever happened, you decided, hey, I'm not finna go back there, and you decided to do something different? Yeah, and I even got a letter from somebody I knew that said, don't come back. Don't come back. <laughs> right, 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 right. That was some good advice. <laughs> right, right. I, I, but, you know, said that, that you, you come to find out who you are in places like that, in times like that. Yeah. I can, but... I can remember uh, I, I had to learn to be me, and I had to learn how to eat with my hands and not get food all up in here. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> I had to learn it. And uh, uh, the, the stewards, uh, the, the quote, houseboys would be standing around looking. Let's go watch The American today. Let's see what he's going to do. It's going to be fun. Let's go watch. <laughs> so, you know, and I finally got a measure of you know, being able to do things and look up to them and they say, so there was a cow tied around the back of the, the governor's mansion. Now, the only reason this cow is tied around there is because he's about, to, he's about to get slaughtered, right? Right. And so I'm saying to the governor, I'm saying, damn, I wonder if the cow knows that he's going to get slaughtered. One of the houseboys must have heard me because the next morning I had to run from uh, where I stayed in the little guest quarters to the main house, which is through a kind of a field of high grass. They done killed the damn cow, cut off the head, put the head in the path that I run on. I ran up on that head, I screamed. Oh. <laughs> and the house was fell out. That is they pretty fell, dramatic. Oh. <laughs> That's pretty dramatic, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty dramatic, man. And they fell out. The governor come running around the side of the house with the police and you know, what 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 you know? Uh -huh, look at the American. You know. Well, 
that's a wonderful story that leads us into something else. I think um, one of the main things about New Art 360 is that uh, we like talking to people who have been in the industry for a while and have knowledge and have, uh, you know, viewpoints on what's going on. How do you see right now, as you know, the writer's strike uh, just uh, opened up uh, this week and uh, they're in the second day, I think today is the second day. And um, what are your takes as a professional actor that has been in the business for a long time, has done a range of things in the industry? So uh, what what is your take? Uh, with What can you share from your perspective about this writer's strike? Well, it's, first of all, it's a business. And the people that run the business are after profits for themselves and their shareholders, period. And so they're going to squeeze to get more profit. That's the name of the game. Yeah, I get good content, blah, 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 but only towards profit. Writers are saying, uh, we're not making a living wage. And in fact, it's you've turned it into, you studios have turned it into a gig industry, which means, uh, you know, I'm hired for the day kind of a thing. Um, we're not making living wage. We can't make living wage. And then on top of that, there is the whole notion of new media. Now, we've been fighting new media for uh, 20 some years. The streaming is part of new media. Yes. Now comes AI. Right. So how do we get ahead of that? Because we know that you, studio, will do everything you can to maximize and pull in this doggone industry and push us out. So all of that is the case. Now, that's just the writers. Uh, actors is coming up. <laughs> Their negotiations is coming up in, enough, in a, inside of a month, as is um, uh, the crew. I forgot their title. Okay, technical crews and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you've yeah. got two more things that's coming up. Uh, how does it affect me personally? I'm waiting to find out if a show that I'm doing is getting picked up or not. Right, uh, right, right. Uh, Wonder Years. Uh, I, I, everything is in flux. Uh, and, uh, I got to stop spending money. I got to stop going to Stater Brothers. Ain't no more movie going to the movies kind of a thing. My wife's birthday is coming up and Mother's Day. What am I going to do? Got to cut back. (laughs) And that's the reality. That's the reality. Well, you know, uh, one thing that's interesting, I've studied, um, uh, you know, Hollywood, uh, you know, going to film school myself and just studied the history. And as you said, you're right. It's uh, it's a business. And for the writers and the other people in front of the camera and people behind the camera, it becomes uh, the business has really shifted a lot. It reminds me really of the shift that took place from analog to digital with music. Yep. How yep. that shifted and changed yep. the whole dynamic of the industry, basically. And I think uh, now we're seeing that affect the visual mediums of entertainment now. And like you said, the streaming platforms... Um, you know, has just, I mean, they're becoming ubiquitous. I mean, streaming is becoming the new way of consuming entertainment, uh, visual entertainment like this. So it's a, it's a uh, very interesting time. And when you talk about labor and, and management, uh, that has always been at the forefront of a lot of things on this capitalist, uh, perspective of things. Yeah, but it is, and, uh, it's an ongoing fight and, and part of the studio's problem is that technology is to the point now where people are making films with <laughs> with cell phones. Right. And so, I mean, so they got issues also. Right. You know, everybody got these issues and they have to be uh, worked through. Right, right, right. Uh, but, then, but, but there's people like you, you know, who uh, your whole work that you're doing in Burkina Faso, uh, I, I just think that's fantastic. The whole notion of uh, there being this women's women's film festival coming up, right? That's 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 monstrous. That's monstrous. Well, so who, you? Huh? 
<laughs> Who knows you? Yes. Well, well, that that you know that's a, a subject for another time, Richard. Uh, we're talking to you today, so uh, yeah. uh, uh. you know. And what's cool is that um, you know it, it is the evolution of uh, you know these careers. Your career, for example, what would you have imagined? that you would be doing the things that you do, even though you're an actor, you're always on television, you're always in some film here and there and, you know, doing your thing on that level, but you're doing so many other interesting things. Uh, why don't you just share with the audience a bit, you know, some of the other things that you're doing outside of the Hollywood or entertainment space? This same fellow, Duma and Globu, um, we had tried to find a way to do some of the things that were magical in New York City. He's back in Johannesburg, uh, and he's been doing, um, he, he's produced a series that's been going, ongoing now for, I think, almost 30 years <laughs> on uh, SABC. So we wanted to recapture some of the magic that we had back there when we were young Turks and revolutionaries and, you know, and doing the work of... Uh, uh, red, black, and green power. Tried a couple of things that SABC didn't happen. Um, hit That's on a, a note. South African broadcast for our audience. Yes. <laughs> uh, 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 hit on the notion back in 2010 of recreating the moment Mandela walked out of prison. It was mm-hmm. the 20th anniversary. Uh, the government had forgotten about it. They were trying to tamp down anything Mandela so they could get things done. Um, uh, ANC had forgotten about it, so we got permission to do it. Uh, Come up with a wonderful program. About a week and a half out, ANC woke up and said, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, You Americans, (laughs) they call Duma an American now. Uh, (laughs) No, uh, we're taking over. Uh, We're going to do a lot of the things that you want to do, but we're taking over. And we're going to bring 10,000 people. So at that moment, you throw up your hand. You say, oh, wow, okay. You know, that's, that's, that's our job is done. Coming back from that, I met a fellow named Jabril Diallo on an airplane coming back from South Africa. And he told me, oh, you just finished that. Well, you ought to come to the 50th anniversary of Senegal's independence. Do you want to come? At that point, you try to hold your breath in. Look the person in his left eye, <laughs> where you can see some kind of truth and tell him as clearly as you possibly can, yes. <laughs> right. The people that were on the plane that President Watt sent to New York to pick up the delegation to come at the 50th anniversary, there was about 100 people on board. All of those 100 people ultimately ended up being part of what's called the African Renaissance and Diaspora Network. Ah, okay. That's how it evolved. Okay. That's how it evolved. Um, met President Wad. He um, had just got this big, huge statue built. That's bigger than the Statue of Liberty, by the way. Um, uh, and a new theater that the Chinese people had built for him. The Koreans built the statue. He looked at me and said, "Mr. Gant, I want you to do some work for me. I want you to, I want you to build the theater of the diaspora." Do it. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) So I came back to New York, uh, got to writing the right proposal, you know, took too long. I forgot this is Africa. Right. Can't take long. You cannot. You cannot. You got to bring it in there quickly. Yeah. Too long and he was out of office. Ah. Ah. But it's come back up again. Oh, cool. (laughs) And and, uh, I have to take a trip to Senegal uh, in the next couple of months um, and speak to the uh, brother who is uh, heading this big, huge mu- new museum that they have. And what I'm talking to him about is the theater of Richard, the diet. Richard, you're taking me with you. You hadn't realized that yet, but oh. you just let the cat out the <laughs> bag. Absolutely. You're, ta- you're taking me with you, bro. <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. I would love that. You take Because I'm doing some work with the museum in Burkina Faso, if I didn't mention that to you. No, you did not. I, uh, in conjunction with Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, oh. what they call the Gullah Geechee Corridor. 
So you, I'm you putting a project that. together to connect them on the music, the rich music history that comes out of South Carolina and North Carolina, yeah. that Gullah Geechee Corridor, they call it, from John Coltrane to Cat Anderson to Freddie Green, all these cats uh, that have made music legends out of jazz, jazz that has formed and, and blues that comes out of those areas are is directly connected to the the Ghanaian uh, uh, Empire, the Mali Empire, Sungai, yeah. the musical uh, yeah. instruments that come out of that area were directly connected, bro. So this is so profound uh, what you're saying. So you're taking me with you. That's all I know. Okay, so so then we need an offline conversation to begin to. Of course, we with, do. With with, with <laughs> notions of how this can work. Because, Always. You know, I have I have been every time I talk to anybody in South Africa about film, I'm asking them, how come you haven't done it? It's something about the, uh, um, oh, the city, uh, the jazz city that was mowed down. Oh, okay. I don't know yeah. a whole lot. I've heard some of that history. Yeah. I've yeah, heard some yeah. of that history. Yeah. And yeah. just like uh, uh, Barbara Allen, who I introduced you to, the filmmaker, uh, she, yes. she was in South Africa a couple months ago as well. And now she's encouraged, you know, the drum was the equivalent of Ebony Magazine in uh, South Africa yes. publication yes. called yes. The Drum. Yes, and yes, yes. Ebony, she now is looking at a project to do a comparative concept about how they relate the drum uh, publication and what was going on in South Africa at that time and what was going on in the States with the Civil Rights Movement and Ebony Magazine. And well, she has to, she has to talk to Duma. Uh, yes, Duma used absolutely. to write for Soweto News, for instance. Oh, okay. Well, he would be uh, a great resource for her. Yeah, and a he, great resource. Uh, you know, a brother won uh, Best Picture at Fespaco, and the name of his film was called The Drum. Drum. It was about that publication and how it got started, the whole thing. He won Best Picture uh, at Fespaco a few years ago, mid, mid-2000s. Uh -huh. Yeah, so... These we're connecting the dots, Richard. That's what's right, so cool. Right now. Yeah, we're that's what the Wall 360 is about. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, there you go. Now we're really finding what we're about. The name of that the name of that township was called Sophia Town. Okay, Sophia Town. Yeah. 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 Kayla and all of those people came out of there. That is some beautiful history, Richard. Yeah. So yeah. now tell me, just as we kind of conclude uh, about ARDN and what you're doing and what that initiative uh, from a broader perspective is about. The African Renaissance and Diaspora Network was formed to, um, um, to advocate for the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Without just naming them exactly, you already know what they are, water, uh, gender-based violence, all, it, that kind of thing. Um, uh, we have been working on a project called the Red Card Campaign for about five or six years now. And that was a campaign started by FIFA, FIFA, the World Football Organization. And basically what it is, is a pledge that we ask you to raise a red card as they do in football. Got a red card. Uh, and you're pledging to end all forms of violence and discrimination against women and girls. We were fortunate enough to uh, engage you uh, and your Burkina Faso work uh, to uh, uh, introduce people to that notion, and you got a, got a great response to the point where some of them are even making little short films about that. That's right. That's right. There has been other films made in the Nollywood that has a theme in and around Red Card, where where the person who was abusing this woman. This police chief was ultimately arrested himself. And as he was being arrested, of course, on his windshield on the rearview mirror was hanging a red card. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's pretty so, cool. Uh, so, so all of that is, is going on, and it, it's, it's moving along. Um, I am involved with a, um, a project that the red card has formed has made happen. It's called One Million Voices. One Million Voices came about because some people in South Africa were saying, you know, the red card is fine. It raises awareness. It causes people to understand a little bit more. But it's not necessarily helping the abused people. 
Um, we have a way that we do with uh, um, uh, women who contracted AIDS, for instance, and are abused beyond that. Uh, and, it, and what we do is focus groups where we ultimately tell our story. And in the process of telling our story, we can get that weight off of us. We can talk about it. It is a healing process. It's healing for me, and it's healing for the person who hears it. Mm -hmm. it the story is powerful. We are artists. We understand that concept. If you are listening to a person's story, if you are listening, you have engaged, you have stepped into that person and that story. You, your emotions are involved. Your everything is involved. So a person is telling their, their story about that abuse, and we understand that they are releasing that. We go along with it. It's a healing process. And that, so that's what the One Million Voices is. We have an AI element that we're adding to that. The AI element is looking at if they, we can get enough stories, we can look at the story, begin to look at the story and find out what the healing element of a story is. Is it the tone? Is it the, 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 the connection, word connection? What is it? Whatever can come out of AI, we know that um, uh, society, government wants to know. It can help. That's our project. That's 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 amazing. And you're right. Um, I had the opportunity and the pleasure to work with you directly uh, this past uh, February uh, as I did work there in Burkina Faso doing the FESPACO uh, Film Festival and Market that happens uh, biannually. And uh, it was just incredibly received. Uh, young people embraced the idea. They did promotional videos, the whole shot. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing that work with you, Richard. Oh, well, that depends. I, 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 I want to be there to see it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, listen, Richard, uh, as we kind of wind it up here, uh, uh, one other kind of key thing I wanted to talk about because you've been in the industry for for a long time was the whole idea of uh, you know I hosted a panel uh, moderated a panel at the international what they call association of uh, film commissioners uh, conference um, and they do it here in Los Angeles once a year and they travel other places in the world so people were here from all over the world and one of the panel I moderated was about diversity, inclusion. Uh, so from your perspective, as we kind of wrap this, um, how do you see uh, the film industry at this point, irregardless of all the labor issues that are happening, but in terms of um, do you think things have gotten better or do you think things are going backwards? Or do you think things are in a neutral position right now as it relates to on-screen talent and behind-the-scenes talent as it relates to the industry itself? In the 70s, it was, even though there were various of us that were in film school, even though there were various of us that were in film school, when you get down to Hollywood, um, you never saw uh, any blacks on stage. I mean, behind the scenes. Bill Cosby show, the Cosby show, yes, uh, there, were, there were blacks and you, you gloried in seeing them. Um, <clears throat> I can remember uh, believing that we, my group of actors that came along when we came along after those years, uh, were in the vanguard. And <clears throat> our job was to bring in uh, more black folks. I can remember standing on the corner when I went back to uh, um, uh, New York after going to LA. Went back to New York, standing on the corner, 117th and uh, 7th Avenue. And here comes some hoodlums backing around the corner. I'm saying, now what's these boys up to? What do you, what do you boys up to? And they were saying, this, 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 this. And if he gets around here, I'm gonna catch him here and I'm gonna pull the camera all around. I mean, that was everything, right? I said, okay. oh, man, it's happening, it's happening, yeah. it's happening. The same thing in theater. 
right? This is the exact same thing in theater. So now, from that moment to now, I uh, the, the one of the shows that I do, a couple of shows I do, are in Atlanta. Atlanta, Atlanta, in a lot of ways, is the promised land. In a lot of ways, uh, the particular show I'm in, everybody you see is black. Everybody, everybody. Yeah, you know, the, you you'll see some Chinese folks, or uh, Mexican or two, or, and some white folks. But everybody else is black. It is fantastic. Uh, it's the way of the world. I think that this particular shot that we're going through, this is not the black exploitation era uh, in the late 60s. It's not that, early 70s. It's not that. Uh, I think blacks have made uh, inroad um, that they will always be a part of. Um, uh, th 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 they are part of the industry. It's not just actors or story. It's the industry. I, th I think that's just fantastic. I can't wait to see how, how all this works out. Well, I appreciate that, um, that optimism from you. And you've been around it for a long time. And so it makes sense for you to give that assessment because that's what you see. And yeah. I, I love it. I love it. Richard, this has really been uh, awesome, man. Thank you for taking the time and sharing part of your journey uh, in the industry and some of your exploits around the world, uh, especially on the continent, and uh, what you're doing currently. And we wish you all the best, Richard. Uh, you, you, you. I mean, I, it's hard to express how excited I was when I got you to uh, work with me on a project. So, uh, you know, it's always been a pleasure, man. It's always well, been a pleasure. Well, uh, thank you. And thank you for you being you. <laughs> oh, no problem, man. You got it. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, there are certain people in our industry that are saints. And they're saints because of the work that they do. Uh, to 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 involve people, bring people, introduce people, and you're one of those kinds of folks. Wow! And, and so, well, thank you. I appreciate that. You. I appreciate that, Richard. You uh, taking that time again to be on Noir 360, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. And like I said, I'm going to Senegal with you, man. I, We're I, putting I, it I, in I, the I, universe I, right now. We're going to have to make it happen. <laughs> We're going to make that happen. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to Noir 360. The Film Verdict gives you Noir 360, hosted by Rashid Bahati, a global podcast that explores the impact and influence of Black cinema around the world.